Ben Meadowcroft, uh, Senior Director of Product Management uh, at Rubrik. I've been at Rubrik for a little bit over four years now. Uh, before that, I was at VMware for about six years. Uh, and prior to that, I did some stints at Adobe and AWS, and then a bunch of smaller companies back in the UK where I'm originally from, which you can probably tell by my accent. Um, but yeah, let's dive into the demo. So the first thing you'll see on the screen, this is our global dashboard. So this is what a customer would see across our entire data estate. And it's covering you know, what's being protected in the public cloud, on SaaS services like M365, and also the you know, core enterprise workloads within the data center. And we do a lot of reporting on um, you know, what's protected, where it's protected. The, uh, you know, we can see the details of you know, the cloud, some of the, the volumes that we're protecting here. So it's just a, a small demo environment. Uh, but over here on the right, is where we have our security applications that we've been talking about that are built on top of our visibility to those immutable version copies of the data. And so this is really our ransomware investigation uh, capabilities, our threat hunting capabilities, our sensitive data discovery capabilities. And I'll be walking through uh, those today. So the first one, um, just picture the scene. I'll, I'll kind of set this out almost scenario based as we walk through this. Yeah, I've received a, a notification. You know, we can connect to various SIM and SOAR platforms. We can also send out alerts over email and so on. I, I've been informed that there's an issue with the workload or, or multiple workloads. And I want to go and investigate that. I can go directly to that, uh, but then we wouldn't see this nice dashboard that I'm showing you now. So assume I, I landed on the dashboard uh, and I've come in and I, I want to dig into this area. So what we show the, the customer is really you know, a very quick view, what we're protecting, and then really the, you know, that, hey, we have some anomalies that, that need to be investigated here. Uh, over on the right, we, we have a, a view as well on how healthy the, the analysis pipeline is. So all of the prerequisites that we have around backups, indexing, the analysis jobs uh, shows up there as well, so that I can instantly see if there's a problem with my analysis that, that maybe I'm not getting results through because of an issue with, say, backups, and I can drill into that. The other nice thing that we do is really give you a view on exactly what's changing and how it's changing across your entire data estate. So here I can see, um, you know, uh, we'll dig into the suspicious files in a, in a minute, but I can see what's been deleted, added, modified over the last seven days. I can extend that out like the last 30 days if I want to see a few big changes that, that happened over here. Um, and I can slice and dice out a few different ways. I can separate out just changes to my NAS, my physical Windows, Linux, my VMs, uh, and so on. So this, this is kind of the, the initial landing page. So, hey, 11 anomaly events, how do I kind of dig into that and understand exactly what, what's going on there? So here I can see all of my workloads where I flagged an anomaly. Um, I can also see where they're located. Here's my vCenter information. I can see, uh, yeah, the, the name of the workload. Um, and I can also see the severity that we flagged it as for, from an anomaly perspective. And I'll, I can dig into to the calculations we do there. But I can also see, and, and what I've done here, I, I basically ranked uh, it in order of most suspicious content to least uh, within my anomalies. And then I can also see what's been deleted, added or modified uh, between these two points in time that I've detected the anomaly between. Um, so with that, I, I can also do a few other things. Um, you know, if I was uh, looking at this a couple of years ago and I didn't have any thoughts on, hey, what am I going to do to investigate this or contain it? You know, I might say, oh, I can, you know what, my backup pro solution, I can recover everything within a few minutes just by going and recover. So we do support mass recovery for sure. But we often find, as we're talking with customers, they, they don't just immediately come in and mass recover. They want to understand what's happened first. And you know, that's obviously a good thing. So as I drill in, um, let me go to the summary tab here. Uh, so I can see a, a, a little bit on, you know, I, I can see a history of changes on this particular workload over time. You know, see exactly what's, uh, you know, how many suspicious files have been added. I can go in and, and see, I, you know, this most recent one, I've, I've got just under 4,000, what's been deleted, added and modified. And I can go through, I can pin those if I wanna uh, just keep one there, there to, to kind of look at. I can also see all of the details on the event timeline. 
So this gives you all the background on you know, exactly how our analysis took place, what we've uncovered, when we uncovered it, and, and how we uh, informed you about that. So we can see that the, the last piece here is that you know, we did detect an anomalous file system activity, but also signs of encryption or ransomware attack. And so this is where we're bringing in the ability to view not just change rates and things like that, which is pretty straightforward, but also analysis of the content itself, analysis of the, the backup content to see you know, whether things like increased entropy has occurred. Uh, and we use that to feed into the model and help with the, the severity that we uh, select coming out of this. Can you elaborate a bit the mm -hmm. anomaly detection? Yes. Yeah. How is it working? What are the influences that something is flagged as an anomaly? Sure. So I'll, I'll, I will answer the question. I'll do it in a couple of phases, if that's okay. Our anomaly detection today is really two key stages. There's an initial stage where we're essentially operating on the metadata that is sent up from, uh, the, the, you know, from where the customer's data is protected. We send metadata signals about the changes, about the, you know, what's been added, modified, deleted at the file level, a few other signals um, about the size of the backups and, and so on. So there's a whole heap of metadata signals that we're sending up about the change. We analyze that, uh, comparing it to, you know, that goes through the first stage model. And really that helps us to identify, you know, does this change just at first blush look anomalous or not? And that's sent up to our uh, machine learning model that's operated on our SaaS based service that's making that initial determination. Um, with that, it's then make it, you know, does look at the, you know, things like the, the entropy of the backups and so on. But if we then want to get the more file content centric view of things, where we want to dig deeper into the anomaly, we then operate that local to the data. So the customer's content, the content of the files never leaves their data center as a result of this analysis. We're essentially pushing operations down to say, hey, calculate the uh, you know, signals like the entropy. When we talk about threat hunting, we're, we do a similar thing to calculate um, or run Yara rules locally against those files and so on. We're, we're sending that down and it's executed locally against the local copy of the, the data uh, there. And the results of that analysis are then sent back up, which goes into our second stage in, uh, model. And that's where we make the determination on whether this is truly, uh, you know, looks like a ransomware attack or not. The detail of the model does change over time. So, uh, you know, I've been working in this area of the product for a few years now, and we evolved the model. Um, you can look at some of the white papers we put out like two, three years ago when we first launched this and look at the machine learning models we use then. They've changed now. You know, we've had two years of real world experience, um, well, actually probably close to like three, three years now of real world experience. Actually getting the data from customers, responding to them, uh, or helping them respond to an attack and analyze that uh, and really tuning that model, tweaking it. So we've changed machine learning model algorithms a few times. We've changed uh, the factors that we bring in. And, you know, it's a constant evolution, uh, honestly. The, I think the more interesting thing is how we enable the rollout of updates to the model. You know, we're very careful in, in how we do that. In the, you know, we'll have a, a model that's running with a certain set of signals. It's been trained with various data sets ones that we've uh, you know, taken from anonymized customer input, uh, other ones that are simulated, others that are based on you know, various other internal and external sources. And those data sets we've grown and accumulated over time based on that real world experience. And as we're rolling out new models, um, obviously we do a lot of internal testing, but when we're ready to, to kind of pull the trigger on, on putting it out into production, we do so very gradually and we have the capability of uh, running it in, in kind of almost a shadow mode where we keep the existing model going. We'll start rolling out the new model and we're constantly comparing, uh, looking at, uh, you know, like the confusion matrices and so on of the ML model to ensure that we're not regressing on our ability to, you know, ensure we're, you know, dialing in on true positives, but not, you know, uh, raising significantly like uh, false positives and, and things like that. So we're constantly monitoring as we're rolling it out, running it against production data. So the details of the model, they'll change. But the, the key, for me, the key takeaways or the key importance of the model is how we're able to continue evolving it based on what we're seeing our customers experience and do so in a way that's non-disruptive, really 
uh, you know, almost invisible to our customers in that sense. They just see the product getting better and improving over time. More data, more training, better AI. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, you know, a, a lot of machine learning is dependent on the data that, that you've had, you put in, and you can have simulated data sets. So that's very useful. You know, we do that as part of our modeling as well. Um, but I, I think Josh mentioned earlier, you know, we do have, uh, we introduced uh, kind of a ransomware response team in our support organization. And that's, for me, there's really two key benefits of having that team that works really closely with our customers. And, and to be clear, they're not an instant responder. You know, we're, we're not taking an instant response role, but what we are doing is helping the team teams during their instant responses. If they've got external uh, IR teams coming in or uh, you know, backup teams who need assistance, we help with, hey, this is what we can deliver for you. This is how we do it. Uh, and we really help support our customers through that journey. But also as we're helping with that, we're also able to see in real fine grained detail exactly how they're being attacked, what's, what's happening on their system so that we can continually improve what we're doing on the ML side as well. And you know, having been able to do that over you know, three and a half years now, um, also it, you know, we've really had to be able to continually improve what we're doing and step our game up there. Yeah, and, and I see Rubrik in the perfect position to do kind of Post IR, you have one team that is specializing to stop whatever this attacker was doing, but mm -hmm. then you need to get back to the production. Yep. And this is where I see Rubrik could fit it to, to get customers back. <laughs> to, yeah, uh, I, I, absolutely. I, I think that's, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk through, uh, you know, Josh, Josh kind of touched on in, in detail what we do from a ransomware perspective, what we do from the sensitive data piece, what we do from threat hunting, and I'll talk through all of those. But really the genesis for those ideas didn't come from like me or Rama as product managers. You know, it came from our customers who, yeah, when we were on those calls with them, uh, when our support team was working with their teams, their instant response teams were like, hey, you know, can you answer these questions for us? It's like, you know, this is what we're doing. Can you help us with X, Y, or Z? And so what we'll be walking through today is really you know, what we've been asked for, you know, is uh, saying, hey, you have access to all this data. Can you make it consumable for us? Can you help us ask questions of the data and get responses back? And so that's really what we'll be, we'll be walking through today. Uh, so here, yeah, I can, I can see what's changed. Uh, here I can also go older anomalies if I want to investigate, hey, what's happened in the past on this machine. We see there's a lot of anomalies. Uh, this doesn't happen on customer sites that often. This is a demo environment, so a lot of uh, a lot of stuff is a uh, you know a little bit out of the ordinary here. But yeah, I can go do that. I can download CSV information. Uh, let me download the CSV here. Um, this is also available via APIs and so on. We can export this and uh, and provide it. Um, I can go look at the the CSV. Open that up. Uh, and you see details on you know the file paths file names, directories, uh, I can get details on exactly what happened. And I'll show you this in the UI, um, you know, what was added, modified, deleted, whether we flagged it as suspicious based on our internal processing, and, and then some metadata about, you know, changed, modified times and so on on the file as well. Um, but enough that the, the boring data, let me go back to the pretty UI. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if I'm going into the user interface and, and, and looking at this, I can go in, and you know, look at the, the file system here. Uh, drill down into my C drive. I can start browsing around. Uh, we do also the 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 insights that we detect, uh, you know, and the changes that we have. We we let you filter on those as well. So here I can uh, highlight. You know, just show me what you flagged as suspicious, and that helps me narrow down very quickly to this file shares directory. I can drill into that. And I can see, oh, you know, I've got like HR department, IT department, legal, marketing, um, lots of suspicious content or suspicious files that have been flagged here. You know, a few deletions, additions, well, not much modifications though. Um, and I can view some more metadata about the size of, you know, each of these directories, the size of the changes and so on. Um, but what I'm gonna do, let me uh, just go back up a level here. So yeah, my file shares, I saw HR, IT, legal, but you know, was there any sensitive information in there? You know, how how is you know how can I really help triage and prioritize this environment? Well, we can go over and uh, I'll just in in context 
open up directly within that file shares environment, I can see exactly what sensitive content, what sensitive data uh, is being uh, identified here. So let me just sort that by sensitive sensitivity. I can see that, hey, I've got sensitive data. It's on you know, multiple folders with, within there. So you know, HIPAA information, US PII, I can go in and, and click on that. Um, you know, get a little bit more information here on, uh, on the actual hits that I got. I can look at uh, information like who has access to this, you know, with, what are the permissions on that, that folder and so on, and, and drill in and get some more details on, on all of this. And all of this as well is downloadable. You know, I can download you know, the CSV with files, uh, with hits where I've got sensitive data information. We can also flag up uh, uh, sensitive data that has open access where you know, the permissions are overly broad. Um, I can uh, download uh, CSVs for stale files that haven't been touched in a while. I've got a lot of insight and, and capabilities to, to slice and dice and, and download specific uh, items of information there. Let me, let me go back here. So I, I can imagine at this point, you know, what I said earlier is like, yep, that's great, but how does that help the, the security team? You know, we're giving this information. It's in the the, the UI that the uh, the backup team are living in, and it's great for them. But how do we communicate? How do we bring them together so they've got a common view of, of what's happening? So all of the pieces that we expose here, um, you know, are exposed via uh, you know our APIs. So Josh talked about the interfaces. We have kind of the HTTPS interface that he mentioned, where we have the HTML5 uh, piece. We also have our uh, you know APIs that are available as well. Um, and so via our APIs, via our SDKs, and via the specific integrations that we build and provide for our customers into uh, XOR, uh, for example, other SOR platforms that we're working on, as well as different uh, SIM solutions and so on, we're able to surface this information and plug this into our customers' tools of choice. So let me switch over to one of them. So here's one. Uh, I'm from the UK and we had a, a show uh, over there called uh, Blue Peter. So here's one I prepared earlier was a kind of catchphrase I use. I'm both dating myself and, uh, you know, uh, giving a little bit of insight into my background there. But hey, I, I switch over to this tool. So this is the kind of tool that the security teams are gonna be in much more commonly. Um, let me drill down and look at my, my new instance today. And I can see, you know, some pretty dashboards and, and so on. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, the kind of screen that you would then see if I drilled down and, and looked into to one of those uh, anomalies. Uh, so what, what we've done here, we've taken the anomaly uh, event that we've generated within Rubrik. We can export that uh, or, or send that out of the system in a variety of different ways. Here we've pulled it into the Excel platform. And we've, uh, the, the way that they've, uh, the playbook that is set up here is created a, an instant automatically on that. And you know, then that can be assigned, it can be investigated and, and so on. So a couple of things that we do, uh, you know, first of all, that metadata, you know, the information on what's been added, modified, deleted, gets surfaced up here, you know, very prominently. I, I can see that straight away. I can also see how many data classification hits have been present within this system as well. Um, if I drill down, we also have another tab here. The, uh, you know, we got Rubric Polaris tab. If I drill down into that. Um, you know, I can see the timeline that I had earlier within Rubrik. I can also see a summary of the hits that I have. Uh, and you can also see the details on, you know, exactly what has been, uh, been here. I can see HIPAA, CCPA hits. Oh, here's an interesting one. I've got my AWS credentials. You know, we can also classify and identify those. So what we're putting in the hands of the security operators here is a real view on, you know, as I'm looking at this, as I'm triaging this, how important is this for me to be spending my time on? Does it have sensitive information there? Does it have other, you know, things that I may want to then pivot and look at and think, oh, you know, I found AWS credentials on this machine. That's obviously a concern. I need to go and uh, start looking at potential activities there. Is there, if a user, for example, created, um, but by what it sounds like is if a user created like a, an Excel sheet with a bunch of passwords, for example, mm -hmm. that, that would trigger an event. Um, is, it, is it also have an integration where I can, instead of having to go into your own portal, I can send off an event somewhere and then SecOps, whoever that is, can then investigate it through that. It wouldn't be, they would have to come in 
actually and look in your port. I mean, yeah, the portal is lovely, exactly. but um, no, it's for sure. Portal. And sorry, I maybe wasn't clear. I actually switched from the rubric portal. This is now a third party. This is uh, Palo Alto's X, Cortex X or okay. uh, portal that we're looking in now. <laughs> the, the key thing here now, this has been exactly that, you know, I now the, the, the insight from rubric has been sent into, you know, my security team's tools of choice. Yeah, so they're able to now look at it and get the same insight that we were putting in our pretty UI on the rubric side, but look at it in the context that I care about, you know, with it, with an XOR. And we can, uh, you know, th this is uh, enriching that with, you know, information on, hey, this is the uh, sensitive data information. This is, you know, what you've got CCPA, personally identifiable information, healthcare mm -hmm. information, Azure, AWS credentials, et cetera, are located on this. And so, now as a uh, security operator, that helps me you know, really prioritize my time because you know, when I talk to the security teams, they have no shortage of events to, to look at. You know, that's, that's not an issue. The, the issue is enabling them to prioritize and, and spend the time effectively, you know, look at you know, where is the most risk, help them really narrow down quickly on that. So by putting these, this data into their tools, we enable them to do that very quickly. Um, and have a common view on you know, what they're seeing in their tools and what the, the, the IT operations teams are seeing within their tools as well. And, and help them link this to the other things they're seeing from the Palo Alto logs and a, exactly. as yeah. the same incident. Uh -huh. yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. And so, you know, th this for us, um, you know, kind of the strategy that we've taken with, with, our, uh, with our product here is we want to make sure we're putting the right building blocks in place for our customers to be able to deliver the security response that they want to, to have. And so, uh, you know, we send the events uh, into this, we enable them to be, you know, so that they can create instance. We can enrich those instance with the metadata that we've discovered um, around sensitivity, around uh, ransomware attacks and, and so on. So putting it in their tools. We also, um, and I'll show this in our UI, but the, the capabilities that I'll talk through around threat hunting, around uh, doing things like evidence preservation, on-demand snapshots, legal holds, all of those things, uh, we, we expose via our APIs as well and enable them to be integrated into these tools as well. So that you know, whether you, you know, just want a very basic uh, notification that a hey, rubrics notice something, or if you wanna build very complex orchestrated plug in uh, playbooks and things like that, you know, and do things like, hey, when I see this, I want to take an on-demand snapshot. I want to put a legal hold on that. Um, I want to live mount the this into an isolated environment. You know, we're not doing the orchestration pieces. We're enabling and exposing our capabilities and providing sample playbooks and, and so on so that you can put those together and really customize it in a way that makes sense for your organizations. So this is great for the anomaly uh, events, yeah. Do you have the similar capability for auditing the access to the rubric environment? So what I always like to watch very closely, who try to access my backups, yeah? I have a very small number of backup admins. If somebody else tries somehow, even if it is a failed attempt or so, try to log in, I also want to uh, that the uh, alarm is forwarded, maybe a SOC ticket is generated, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And so I'll show that very quickly. Um, I can go into every event that we generate within the, the rubric system, you can uh, send out a rubric. You know, we have a variety of different ways of, of hooking that up. We also send out what uh, the audit logs as well. So I can go in, I can look at my audit logs, um, you know, uh, and you know, this is obviously showing it here. Um, I can maybe look at my failures of different types and no their results. Everyone's used the right password, I guess. This is a perfect system. Isn't it? This, is a, this, is, this is my demo system. So we try and keep it pretty, pretty nice. But I can see exactly who's been logging in. I can search the, the login messages, um, you know, free text search to that. But of course, I can send it out to Splunk and, and things as well so that I'm capturing that externally to the, the rubric system also. Do you store also from, from which source the besides um, um, uh, username from where the user tried to log in? So yes, we tell you the IP address that they tried to connect from. And so inside your network, if they're trying to access the local cluster, we're telling you where they failed from. And most customers will use a combination of our email alert 
all the syslog and then take the host name from that syslog event. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to our global SAS control plane, then yes, we alert on it. But furthermore, you can also put an IP whitelist and say, hey, if you're not on this IP, you don't even get the ability to log in, which is our recommended security practice. Because if you're the other side of the world, you have no legitimate use case to even try and get into this. So kind of just allowing your privilege access management to log in, but mm -hmm. come from anywhere else, you are blocked. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And you still would get an alarm if somebody tried it, yeah? yeah. Try to log in, yes. So we, we've gone through, we, we've, uh, let, let me drill into this actually. So we, we've gone in and identified the suspicious files there. I can go in and I can very quickly see yeah, the, the files that have been flagged as suspicious, they've been added to the system. Uh, I know there's a lot of deletions, so I, I'll put in my deletions as well. And I can see, you know, it's pretty obvious that, you know, we've taken files, they've been encrypted and, and we, we flagged them uh, accordingly. So now, um, you know, now are we ready to recover? Well, maybe not. You know, we don't necessarily, we want to be able to, to look into our backups and see, hey, are there any other threats in there, malware and, and so on that we want to ensure that we're not recovering along with this data. If I want to recover, I certainly can. I can go in and select the specific files and go in and will exclude all my suspicious files for me, give me the ability to, to recover uh, the, those files and we'll walk through that later. I can recover a full snapshot as well. So I have all of those recovery capabilities, but if I want to do more investigation, uh, that, that's where we'll go next. And so this is, as Josh mentioned, uh, kind of the, the really the, the latest thing that we've added into our, our product. And so uh, it's our threat hunting capability. So let me go through and uh, talk through that a little bit. Uh, one of the things I'm often asked is like, okay, so why did Rubrik build this? You know, what, what's the use case? What, what is it used for? I think kind of Josh answered that a little bit earlier, but you know, really, uh, you know, as a product manager, when we, one of our jobs is to prioritize and figure out, hey, what are we going to build? What are we not going to build? Uh, but as we were working with customers, helping them through the recovery, and then working with the incident response teams to, to assist with that, you know, we were getting the same questions constantly from those teams. Um, and it's like, hey, can you help us identify, you know, give, you know, hey, I've got these indicators of compromise. Can you help us identify when these first showed up in the system? You know, when's a good recovery point for us to, to, to go to and so on. And so that's why we introduced this threat hunting. Um, so we support a few different key indicators of uh, compromise. So we support Yara rules. Um, we support file hashes. We also support file paths, file pattern names, and so on. So depending on what the IOC that you want to look for, you know, we probably... You know, got, got a variety of different ways to, to scan for that. Um, so I'm going to walk you through, you know, executing your YAR rule here. So this is all driven via our API as well. So you can absolutely, uh, you know, have your, uh, say your XOR instance have this kind of automated scanning and, and so on as well as part of your response if, if you want to. But yeah, let me go get grab a YAR rule. Um, so I'm just going to go grab one. Uh, so this is one I uh, you know, came across a few days ago, uh, at and uh, you know, they, they did some research. You've probably all heard of the Black Cat ransomware. They, they put this uh, nice little YAR rule together. Um, so just help, you know, just a few key strings here that I want to scan for, you know, certain uh, hexadecimal values at certain points and, and so on. Uh, and, and so I'm just going to go, and this could be one example. Uh, the one I'm actually going to use, uh, as I mentioned, this is our demo environment. So we've got our own little ransomware simulation script to pre-generate all the ransomware events for, uh, for demos. And this is actually a, a little YAR rule that will identify that. You know, searches for a few strings in the, the PowerShell file that we run there. Uh, and as with any good YAR rule, it's focused on things that aren't necessarily going to change uh, from, you know, uh, you know, it's not looking at comments in it and so on. It's looking at... You know, more intrinsic aspects of, of what we're scanning for. And we also scan that, you know, we, we run this as a scheduled task. So we're actually scanning the scheduled task XMLs as well. We, we've got a detection for that. So I'm going to take this detection and I'm going to go and uh, put this in here. So looks good. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and click next. I'm going to run this against the, the cluster I've got connected here. And I'm going to. Let's see. 
I'm going to grab a bunch of uh, systems here. I can choose, I can, you know, filter this down a few different ways. I can select all. Um, I'm just going to scan a couple here, uh, just a handful, just to, to demo uh, what we're doing. And you'll see what I've selected here. And we'll call this uh, uh, XFD7 demo. So now, uh, whenever our SEs come and use this environment for the next 30 days or so, that this will be visible uh, by default, uh, they'll, they'll see that we did an XFD7 <laughs> demo. Uh, we can scan the most recent copy of the, the snapshot that we have, so the most recent backup. That's helpful if I want to just do a discovery across a larger portion of my, my environment, and I don't want to do that against my production system. So as we've been talking with customers, this was actually one of the things that uh, was actually quite interesting to them and different from what they could do with the standard tools that they had on their primary systems today. So if you think about how you would do this, uh, you know, with kind of an agent based approach or, or something, um, it would be going, it would be hitting production, it would be putting load on your production systems. You'd also have incoming network connections, you'd have processes being spun up on your primary system. All of those, you know, obviously, you know, load on the system that can impact your production. Uh, but those other things like the processes that are being spun up, the incoming network connections can all be indicators to someone who's on your box at that time that, hey, you know, the, uh, the security teams are paying attention to the systems that I'm on. And that can, you know, if, we, if you tip the hat to them on that, they may accelerate the time frame. Go ahead and you know rather than looking to do more lateral movement just go ahead and execute the the payload on the environments where they are right now because we're doing this on the backup copy completely separate from production you know all that we're doing is we take the backup and we run this against that backup copy so completely transparent uh, to production no impact on production whatsoever for running the, the threat hunts here, which means no impact on, on the, the primary system. Uh, it doesn't impact your application servers, your database servers, your file servers or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, almost invisible, uh, you know, from that primary system, all they're seeing is that the backup data being come across just as it would normally. The other nice thing that we can do uh, when you think about threat hunting, uh, you know, when you're threat hunting, uh, you know, there's a variety of different things you can do. Um, or ways of approaching it. Uh, but if you're looking at going back in time, you're really dependent on what you've captured previously, historically. Um, we have an advantage or, or where we see our advantage being because we have these versioned immutable copies of the data stretching back over time, we can go in and generate new insights against that historical data. We can go and do threat hunts on the system as it was 14 days ago. So if for whatever reason I wasn't capturing certain logs on that system, or I, you know, I was filtering them, or maybe too aggressively to detect the, you know, the the indicator of compromise, or maybe uh, you know just that system maybe wasn't being scanned previously, or you know some anti forensics has happened. You know the attackers were deployed, they were there for a while, and then they cleaned up afterwards. You know anything that's done on the very latest version on the primary system may miss some of those, but because we can go and generate run this against the historical copies, we can generate those new insights and help you better establish the timeline of what's happened, um, you know, and go in and generate that. So here, let me go through. And so what, what's the date today? It's the 25th. So let's go back, a, say, a week or so. Um, and what I'm going to do is just say, you know, I, I'm essentially just going to go run a, a backup uh, yeah, roughly uh, a week's worth of my, my backup data here, and I'll start at 8 a.m. So super simple. And now I've just gone through and kind of determined the systems that I'm going to scan and how far back in time I'm going to do it. And not on whatever data we captured at the time, but being able to do that against those uh, those images of the system. You know, if we're taking like a, a VMware backup, for example, we have the actual full persisted VMware image that we're able to go in and, and do that on. Uh, I have a few ways that I can optimize and uh, prune the search space and, and things here. Uh, for example, uh, let's say I've written a rule. I'm you know, kind of maybe worried it may be overly broad. I can just say, hey, by default, we'll say, you know, if we match more than 100 indicators of compromise on a given system, we'll just short circuit at that point and say, and present that to you. Obviously, that's editable. I can increase that, decrease it uh, as I want. Uh, control the file size as I'm scanning. 
I can also scan certain paths and directories. This is completely optional. I can scan everything uh, that, that we, we're protecting here on the system. You know, I don't have to do this, but if I'm maybe searching for web shells, for example, maybe I wanna search under those Apache directories or my Nginx directories or my ISS, IIS directories, I, I can put, plug those in here and that will help me narrow the, the scope of what I'm searching. And because we're narrowing it, we're able to speed it up even further. So yeah, you know, I have that control if I want to use it. But I don't have to. I can scan everything um, if we want to go broad. And then a uh, quick summary on what we're scanning, the, the systems that we're scanning, the time range, and, and, and so on. And I'll just go ahead and, and, and click that. And yes, the, the demo is God's favored me, and it actually created the scan. OK. Mm -hmm. okay. So we, we see that that's going to kick off and, and start going there. So um, while, while that's scanning, yes. um, if I understand what you're doing, we're going to look for, we're going to go back in time mm -hmm. and we're going to look for the day where these files no longer show up. Yes. And then that's our recovery point. So is it, is it possible to just tell it to stop when it gets to the point when the rule starts failing to find anything? Uh, we don't stop it today, but we do populate the results incrementally from the, the most recent uh, copy to, to the older copy. So as we're going through the process, essentially for every object, for every backup, where we're doing an optimized scan on that, but those results will be populated incrementally into, into what we're doing here. So I will be able to see, as soon as we find a, a, a point in time that doesn't have a match, you know, we'll be able to see that here. In fact, I've got one that I, I ran previously, I, I can go through and show you. Um, yeah. Okay, true. so yeah, we can say, okay, I got what I need. I think I would say that that's a good idea. We didn't think of that one yet. We'll do that. Let, let me kind of drill into one. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll rewind back actually. Uh, so I, I've got my list of scans there. I can see that's going. Um, this one's got quite a few matches. So I'll drill into this one. This was using, uh, and I can go in and see exactly what parameters I used for the scan. You know, the objects that I'm scanning uh, are here, the time ranges, the limits and, and so on that we entered earlier. The, the indicators of compromise that we're scanning for are all populated here. So I've got a complete record of, hey, this is what the criteria were that we used. And then I can go in and see the matches. So the first thing I'm gonna see is for, uh, let me zoom it in again for everyone. Yeah, this uh, it may look a little odd, this zoomed in uh, some of the stuff, but yeah, you know, I'll see the systems that I scanned. I'll also see the files that were matched and the count of the, the indicators of compromise. Um, we'll also, you know, say, hey, this was a, uh, what we matched on. I think I can, uh, and then the earliest match, the latest match, the, this is the, the match snapshot. So we actually, this, we scanned 10 snapshots and we actually found the indicated compromise in all 10 of them. So we haven't populated the latest snapshot without a match here. If we'd gone to that where, you know, we found a point in time where we don't have a match, it would show up in this column here, this this uh, this latest version. Um, but yeah, I can see exactly, you know, uh, a list of all of the snapshots. All of them have been scanned and the number of IOCs in each of them. Um, I can then also drill down. And so here I'm actually seeing the actual files that uh, were matched by the indicator of compromise that, that I submitted. So I've got three files here. Uh, it looks like I've got a copy of this ransom.ps1 script. Uh, that's on my C scripts directory. Uh, it looks like ooh, David Siles, uh, I'll have to tell him off because he downloaded this and he was, uh, you know, we can, we can see it there in the, in his downloads directory. So he probably was downloaded and, and deployed there. And we can also see, um, you yeah, know, we've got a, we detected the, the ransom tasks. So the scheduled task we can see over in the C -WIS window system 32 tasks directory uh, also flagged up on, on the scan that we did as well. And so obviously we can, we can copy all of these uh, out. Um, we can see the earliest and latest uh, points in time that we match the snapshots on to help give us a, uh, a, a good, help reinforce our timeline in a way that's robust to anti-forensics activity because we're not relying on you know, the, the file system metadata at this point. This is based on, hey, these are files that we found in this snapshot at this point in time. So it's a very strong indicator, well, it's you know, very strongly showing that you know, it was present there. Whatever anti-forensics may have happened on the file system uh, later on, 
we can still show that and help confirm and establish that timeline. Um, and of course, we can show the, the latest snapshot that didn't have a match if we had one. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll add in a few more columns. Yeah, we can pull in metadata from the file system as well, like the last modified time, the created on timestamps. I can add those in here. If I want to see them, it starts making it scroll horizontally a little bit. But yeah, if I, yeah, I may not trust it, but it may be informative. And so I can pull it in uh, and see exactly what the file system was telling me uh, that, you know, at the point that we backed it up. So this is um, obviously giving a lot of insight and helping us really identify, uh, you know, what happened on that system, identifying where that malicious content maybe live, maybe lived, and helping inform us as well. You know, what are some of the recovery options I may want to use for this workload? Well, in in this case here, mm -hmm. it's everywhere. So yep. I want to go back and scan further. So can I simply edit what I did here and change the date range? Uh, not today, but that is one of the, the enhancements that we're, we're planning. So I can keep going back in chunks until... Yeah, as Josh mentioned earlier, this, this is kind of our V1. Um, so there's definitely some workflow improvements that we're, we're planning on adding. That, that is, is one of them. So yeah, we can, we can continue going backwards. Um, at some point, I may, uh, it may inform my recovery options a different way. So if I, if I go back and think about um, kind of the anomalies, uh, let me go and, and drill in here. You know, I may come to a point where, you know, I've scanned the 30 days of snapshot and you know what, this attacker was dwelling in my system for quite a while. I don't have a full, uh, it, it never happens, I know. <laughs> but, you know, I may not have a full image that I want to recover to production. I may have a, you know, I may want to recover that in an isolated environment. You know, I can, I can absolutely do that. Uh, I can recover this full snapshot at this point in time. I can go in and do some additional dynamic analysis on that, dynamic scans, other tools, and, and so on. Uh, but the the what we're able to do, because we're able to do that threat on over a large number of systems over historical points in time, we help you narrow down very quickly to a point that you may want to do that more intensive analysis on, um, you know, to, to pull it into like a secure, secure enclave or isolated recovery environment, and then go and, and, and perform that. Uh, we also, as so this is a, what we would do if I was recovering a, a full snapshot. Um, it will give me the pre-anomalous point in time by default. I can go and override that. Um, you know, I, and then I have a full set of capabilities around live mounting this, which is where we can you know, spin up the system without you know, serving the storage from the rubric compliance. We can mount the virtual disks, uh, in-place recovery exports, whatever recovery scenario you want from an image level we can support, including you know, entire, recovering it entirely disconnected from, from your production environment. Um, or in this case, uh, I may well be like, hey, you know what? I know that based on the IOCs that I found, that it was in the C scripts directory, you know, it was under the Windows system 32. I had a scheduled task. You know what? I don't want to recover my image. Uh, I don't trust it anymore. Actually, what I'm going to do is spin up a new uh, from a new new server, in, uh, new instance of the server, from a new template that I know is clean, is not impacted. And I just want to recover the impacted data onto that. I want to reconstitute the system versus go through a full system image level recovery. Completely support that as well. Uh, so in this case, you know, I would go through, um, uh, you know, highlight here the file systems. I can just select that I only want to recover my deleted files in this case because I went through and, and looked at that earlier. So selected my deleted files and then go through and choose to recover file level. I have a whole suite of options as well. I can download it to my local system. Um, you know, this can be used not just for downloading for recovery, but maybe I want to, I do actually want to download those malicious content onto uh, maybe my investigation workspace. I can, I can download it and pull it directly so I can analyze just those files in, in more detail if I want to. I can go restore it back into the original location. I can put it into a new folder or uh, I can export it. And this is where I'm able to go and choose another system. Um, yeah, you know, I, I can recover it to Ben Metacroft's laptop. Uh, oh, sorry, Ben Metacroft's server, because uh, you know that's where I want to recover to. I, and you know, put, put in path information and so on where I want to place that information, so that I'm able to to actually restore the system into a completely new, pristine server that I've spun up for this recovery use case. So that was really going through at a you know hopefully a reasonable pace 
showing you what we can do from uh, kind of the, the initial anomaly detection pieces and enabling you to go in and enrich that with information about sensitive data, you know, potentially uh, help me to uh, identify things like compromised AWS credentials so I can, you know, maybe expand, expand the scope of my investigation or, you know, see that, you know, maybe there's additional systems that need to be brought into consideration here. Uh, we kind of talked through that enrichment, how we can do that both within the rubric UI, but also we can export that out, send that out into our customer's tools of choice as well on the security practitioner side. And then we uh, also covered, you know, some of the threat hunting that we can do against the backups, how we're able to go through and, you know, populate that threat hunt um, with information that's generated from those historical and as Josh mentioned earlier, as immutable version copies of the data that haven't been edited, you know, a retention locked, you know, can't be deleted and so on. So it's a rich source of, um, you know, raw material that we can add additional insight onto through these capabilities. There's some other pieces that, uh, you know, unfortunately I don't have within this environment uh, set up right now, but, you know, even more additional recovery options around orchestrated recovery and enabling us to, you know, do this at the application level uh, and even surface up those application insights into the, the investigation screens that we, we showed there. Yeah, I, was, I, I think you just answered this, but I was wondering, since this particular one didn't have a clean mm -hmm. um, recovery point, do you have sample playbooks of things to, you know, help either A, clean up the system that we're mm -hmm. going to leave live and use some specific file restores to, yep. or spin up a clean version of the machine and restore to it just mm -hmm. the files that we want to recover. Yes, we do. So uh, we actually have a brand new version of our XL plugin that's going through the, the certification process right now. Uh, but uh, there's a few sample playbooks in that, including exactly that case where we're taking, a, and I'll, I'll talk through that, uh, but essentially we're taking an indicator of compromise, uh, a Yara file that's being published. We're pulling that in to XOR. Uh, we're doing the, the workflow where we're scanning the, uh, you know, from the point of anomaly, we're scanning the prior 10 snapshots. We're detecting whether we've identified a clean point in time or not. If not, we'll go through and run the same IOC and do it against the next 10 and, and so on until we've reached, um, you know, the, I, I believe there's a, a parameter within uh, the, pl the playbook that the user can say to say how far back they, they want to go for that. Um, other pieces that we have within the, the playbooks that we provide as well include uh, kind of file level recovery, image level recovery, and enabling all of these to be put into the hands of the security teams uh, so that they're able to, to do those. They're able to take on-demand snapshots to, you know, if I'm, you know, maybe on my primary system, uh, I've detected an issue and I want a forensic, or I want a immutable version copy of that the system as it is right now. I can go take an on-demand snapshot of that and we'll capture that image level backup within the, the backup system. Uh, I can apply uh, a, a custom uh, protection domain to that SLA domain, we call it, that you know puts it on a retention lock, the uh, SLA domain, so it can't be compromised. I could put a legal hold on that so that I can ensure that it's preserved until the legal hold's removed. So there's a lot of capabilities that we expose. Uh, so the playbooks are really intended to be samples you know, it is really exploring the capabilities that we expose via our API, um, but it is intended to be customized by uh, teams to, to the way that they want to work. It's really just giving them an example of like, hey, this is how you could do it. Um, you know, a few different capabilities. And yeah, I think the more that we learn from our customers as we put that out there and hear from them, the more we'll be enhancing the, the products and you know, the, the, the samples that we provide. So if I want to scan some backups with a third party product, yeah, I have an IR vendor, they have a certain scan engine. Yep. Is there any way to tie into the rubric world and then mm -hmm. get these scans going? Yeah, so one of the, the options that we have is the ability to do a live mount of the point in time copy of the data. So this is one of the things that we're, we're exposing in our, our newest uh, uh, samples for, for XOR. It essentially takes the, that point in time, enables it to be spun up in an isolated environment, uh, or you, you, know, you can connect it to uh, uh, you know, specific networks and, and, and so on. Uh, but it enables you to orchestrate and automate that piece of it uh, what you then have is a 
a, an image that can be spun up or or not. You know, you can power on, power off. You have that control. You can connect it to the network or not. Um, and then, uh, you know, depending on the deployment options of the third party, you know, if you want to push that agent onto there, or if the agent's already on there, um, being able to go and execute that scan via the uh, the, the uh, third party orchestration solution. Okay, great. Right. Yeah, that's good. I think this goes back to the the point earlier. Is you know, I think there was kind of a right at the beginning of the session. So it starts well. Hey, why is Rubrik here from a security perspective? It's because we think we have some things valuable to add, but we're really cognizant that you know there's a lot of tools out there, a lot of workflows that that, that people have. We want to work with those and help integrate with those because you know that's really where we're going to be able to add the most value and and help provide the goodness that we can bring and really enrich and uh, kind of level up what what our, uh, our customers can do today.